Hi guys, today I am going to review Divis Laboratories. Divis Laboratories is one of the largest APA manufacturers in the world and uh, they are also into custom synthesis business for MNC innovator companies and uh, they are also into nutraceutical business as well. So I am beginning with a, a brief story about uh, Divis Laboratories. Uh, Divis Laboratories was started by the founder called Murali Divis. Uh, he done his education in India and he went on to work as a scientist in uh, US. He worked as a scientist for several years and after uh, getting homesickness, he uh, came back to India. Over in India, he worked for Dr. Eddies. Uh, uh, in Dr. Eddies, uh, he joined board of directors and he was given in charge of Cheminor, which was an APA manufacturer itself. So he worked in uh, board of directors for five to six years and he quit and later he started Divis Laboratories. So let's see what are the products uh, Divis Laboratories manufactures and uh, what they do. So they have three kinds of businesses. Uh, custom synthesis for uh, pharma MNC companies, generic APA manufacturing and uh, nutraceuticals manufacturing. So I would describe everything uh, one by one. So custom synthesis for pharma companies is, uh, it's like contract research and manufacturing services. Like uh, uh, when MNC com uh, companies uh, innovates new drugs or uh, new molecules, they would uh, outsource or contract some processes to the custom synthesis pharma companies so that their work getting reduced. So for any companies to outsource to another uh, smaller companies, the smaller companies should be uh, getting a right reputation in order to grab the contract. So initially when Divis Laboratories started as a custom synthesis for pharma MNC, MNC companies, uh, they had the problem of getting a contract initially. So that's why they also started generic APA manufacturing. So in this, uh, they have uh, custom synthesis uh, businesses. It's highly lucrative because the, the margin involved in custom synthesis business is high. So uh, right now they have contacts with all um, many larger MNC companies in the world. So they had the reputation of getting the contract easily. And they have the uh, highly capable, uh, they have the capacity to uh, conduct highly energetic hazardous reaction and so on. So right now they have uh, expertise in innovative process development. Next product or next service, uh, next business uh, segment is generic APA manufacturing. So in generic APA manufacturing, they are the one of the largest APA manufacturer in the world. So if somebody doesn't know what is generic APA, it's uh, like an ingredient uh, which would be put in, uh, put together in order to make it generic drugs. Generic drugs is nothing but uh, not branded drugs, which is uh, manufactured in uh, bulk quantities so that uh, it has the same bioequivalency uh, of the branded drugs. So uh, they, they produce around 30 APA molecules and uh, 10 of them in various R&D processes. And in, uh, in, in the 30 APA molecules, out of which uh, in the 18, uh, uh, for the 18 APS, they are the they are top two manufacturers in the world, and uh, then they are into nutraceuticals. Uh, nutraceuticals business, they they just started or uh, in 2018 or something like that. But uh, the good thing is, nutraceutical business uh, is highly. Uh, mm, uh, profitable so if they uh, this, this is an opportunity for device laboratories to grow over years uh, to uh, have a good segment for them but uh, right now it doesn't uh, contributes much for, for the uh, bottom line 
so uh, bottom line or uh, the revenues so uh, for uh, but for the years to come it would it would con- uh, the contribution of nutraceuticals would uh, go up as uh, as i'm thinking so let's see the timeline of uh, uh, divis laboratories uh, in 1990s they established uh, divis laboratories as divis research center uh, the main focus was on custom synthesis uh, but the apas came into business like i said in the previous uh, previous slide uh, they uh, they also had apas in the beginning itself because they had the problem of grabbing contracts in uh, from the mnc companies in 1995 they had, they started their first manufacturing facility near chautpal hyderabad 2002 they had the second manufacturing facility in chipada near visakhapatnam 2003 they made ipo uh, by listing into nse and uh, bsc 2007 they established the uh, nutraceutical facility at uh, chipada unit uh, 2010 they established new research center hyderabad so, sorry i made a mistake i uh, in the beginning i said the nutraceutical business was started at 2018 it was 2007 actually but uh, uh, still it doesn't contribute much into the uh, the revenues for the divis laboratories so uh, in 2010 they uh, established new research center at hyderabad 2018 they expanded the manufacturing facility uh, with a capital expenditure of uh, 1800 crores and 2019 was a, was a key year when they became the one of the largest ab manufacturer in the world and another uh, things uh, thing that you should uh, remember is that uh, the recent uh, policy from indian government uh, like uh, price incentive uh, uh, package and atmanirbhar bharat program actually helped apa manufacturing to be uh, more efficient and more profitable for indian firms so i am uh, going on to the regulatory or uh, the compliance timeline because uh, for any drug company the regulatory and uh, uh, compliance is very important uh, if it focus on exports for uh, for uh, the major market for drug companies is us if you want to sell your generic drugs or generic apa in, for the us firm you need to have a Uh, drug license uh, your facilities should be inspected and uh, everything should be uh, it's same for the uh, european union and japan as well but uh, the compliance strictness uh, varies so in 1997 they filed first us uh, usdmf that is a drug master file uh, so in Uh, and uh, in 1999 uh, they filed uh, first uh, certificate of suitability for euro uh, both these files are actually uh, to get the drug license for a particular component or apa or generic drug and 2003 us fda inspects their manufacturing for the first time 2011 the the europe gmp and pmda japan inspects the manufacturing facility for the first time and regarding about their r&d and process development uh, the company has research center to uh, research center at uh, drc sanat nagar hyderabad it is a main research center and they also have the process and process development and support centers at uh, Uh, it's uh, various manufacturing units like it has two uh, sites for manufacturing uh, but around six manufacturing units are there so um, in drc and process development they actually help uh, to create new components and improve that uh, process and uh, try to get the component in mass scale that they can manufacture the uh, 
uh, APIs in bulk quantities. Uh, right now I will uh, break up the revenue and uh, sales. Uh, revenue for each, pro each product and uh, sales from uh, geographical uh, uh, sales on the geographical boundaries. So if you see generic APIs contribute much of, uh, uh, around 49 percentage of its sales and custom synthesis business contributes around 41 percentage but if you see custom in the in custom synthesis the margin is higher uh, they have a lucrative margin in custom synthesis business uh, the margins are lower in api business and uh, nutraceutical contributes only 10 percentage as i said previously uh, nutraceutical has a uh, potential to be a key component of this laboratories in the future and uh, if you see uh, most of its sales come from europe uh, which is good because uh, the main thing is the compliances in us is actually going up and uh, uh, the the margins also affecting because of a lot of compliances in europe uh, sorry us and uh, north america contributes around 25 24 percentage of their sales and Asia contributes 12 percentage of their uh, sales and India contributes only 13 percentage. So they, they also have a potential to be a key, key pay, player in India as well. So in a nutshell, uh, let me uh, explain some interesting facts about uh, Divis Laboratories. Uh, they have six manufacturing facility at two locations at Hyderabad and Vishakhapatna. They employ 14,000 people and they have presence in uh, 95 countries. Uh, they have 122 products in various therapeutic uh, portfolios and they are the largest manufacturer of naproxen uh, which is a uh, pain control component and dexomethorphan uh, which is a cuff suppressant uh, in both of them they, uh, they have 70 percentage global share uh, they have 42 drug master file 38 patents and uh, five generics uh, the the uh, the Divis lab is one of the uh, one of the favorites for uh, uh, stock trading or uh, the investors because it gets the best EBITDA margins in the industry. It gets around 40 percentage EBITDA margins in the industry itself. Uh, that might be because of custom synthesis business. Only Torrent Pharma gets near to 34 percentage uh, EBITDA margins. So all other drug com uh, pharmaceutical companies around gets around 20 percentage to 30 percentage EBITDA margins only. They have two uh, subsidiaries. One is uh, Divis Laboratories USA Incorporated and Divis Laboratories Europe uh, AG, which is in Switzerland. Uh, 2017, they got a negative observation from US FDA, but they solved the issue. Uh, uh, from their VSAG unit, they have an exposure of sales. Uh, they have an exposure of 22 uh, percentage towards the sales to uh, US. So uh, any future uh, problems with the compliances actually affects this unit. Now I am I'm doing a product uh, sort analysis. So if you see what is the strength of Divis Laboratories. Uh, they have a cash rich manufacturing of APIs and they are a zero debt company. Uh, the weakness is high revenue from contract research and uh, that is the synthesis, custom synthesis business. They have a high, high revenue. But the problem is if any come, any time the MNC's company has a discretion to give contracts to other uh, contract and uh, contract research and uh, manufacturing companies. 
because they also uh, want uh, less, uh, firms who demand lesser margin as well and uh, the opportunity uh, is in character keratinoid space i said uh, the nutraceuticals is the key player in in the years to come and threats is mainly us fda and other regulatory uh, bodies who would be uh, giving a red flag or something uh, co compliances regarding their inspection and so on i'm doing a industry analysis of pharmaceuticals uh, india accounts 20 percentage of all uh, generic drugs exports and uh, it expects that CAG year of uh, 15 percentage growth annually and uh, uh, the Indian bulk drug industry has actually uh, perceived as an industry of manufacturing simple AP molecules uh, previously in 80s and 90s but they have uh, grown from that perception towards preferred destination for high value and complex APIs right now and uh, the uh, as, a, as a reason for uh, that uh, they also increase R&D uh, more than 8.5 percentage of uh, percentage of their sales as well and right now North America, right now and previously also uh, North America contributes around 45 percentage of total global sales so North America is a key market for any drug companies in the world the industry right now ranks uh, third globally uh, and it has a key advantage of uh, availability of large pool of chemists and scientists and uh, it has a world-class facilities available and uh, we have a low cost operations as well now we are going on to the shareholding pattern previously also say, uh, said uh, they have a uh, the, the promoter pledge uh, is uh, is not significant or uh, you can say it's it's near to zero so right now uh, the promoters holding is around 59.95 in december uh, 2020 uh, they the promoters actually decrease their shareholding uh, from uh, uh, March 2018 they had around 52.05 but if you see the foreign institutional investors uh, have actually increased their stakeholding from 18.41 percentage uh, to 20.37 percentage which is a good sign and uh, domestic institutional investors or mutual funds also have increased from uh, their share only from 15.77 to 16.86 percentage public share holding actually come down uh, which is uh, the main reason is uh, the share uh, the share price uh, was actually booming so a lot of public uh, individuals who are having the share actually sold the share uh, one thing i uh, i was surprised with the shareholding pattern is the the founder murli krishna dv actually holds around 2.85 percentage of the share and uh, i don't know who are the two individuals but uh, probably uh, promoter family itself they holds around 20 percentage and uh, uh, 20 percentage I, uh, I, uh, I think uh, D.B. Satachandra Kiran is the son of Murli Krishna D.B. itself. Right now I am doing financial evaluation. So it has a market capitalization of 91,984 crores. Uh, from which we can understand it is a large cap stock and right now the the price of the stock is at uh, 3465 uh, it has a book value of uh, 314 rupees so it's around uh, 11 times uh, its book value so uh, it is uh, from the price to book value you can always say is that it is uh, overvalued and uh, 
if you see uh, in recent year itself it uh, it actually had a price of uh, 1823 rupees within the past year it's uh, within this year itself and uh, it actually gone as high as 3915 right now it has decreased slightly so and it has a stock PE of 49.2 uh, which is way higher than the industry PE but I as I said uh, because it, ha it it gets around 40% uh, of EBITDA margin in the industry in which uh, all the pharmaceutical gets around 20% uh, EBITDA margins only uh, this is still justifiable and their dividend yield is only 0.46% but they do give out uh, dividends ROC, ROC is good 25.2% uh, ROC is one of the uh, best ratio you should uh, use because uh, it also involves a lot of uh, mostly for pharmaceutical they also in, uh, they involves a lot of capital expenditure as well but uh, for Davis Laboratories, uh, it doesn't matter because the company is uh, uh, debt free. And ROE is 19%. Uh, it's lesser. Face value is 2. Uh, one thing bad about is uh, in future, if the price goes up, it can only do one stock split. Uh, in the past year, they had a sales of 6,571 crores with an operating margin of 40%, nearly 40%, like I said, uh, high EBITDA margins and profit of 1,870, which was fantastic. And uh, sales quarter, 1,701 uh, in recent quarter with a pat of 471 crores. Wonderful and uh, sales growth in three years is nine percentage which is good profit percentage also eight percentage and not bad uh, you can't say it is uh, both of these are highly uh, wonderful but they are okay and uh, eps is uh, it gives an eps of 70 rupees price to book value i said previously also uh, price to book uh, on the price to book value ratio the stock is uh, overvalued but uh, given its position in uh, pharmaceutical industry itself it's slightly justifiable we are going to do the f uh, financial return analysis how much uh, the company makes as a revenue profits everything so if you see from uh, 2009 to 2000 uh, i mean 12 trailing um, months in uh, the the revenue and profits has been going uh, steadily up from 1180 in 2009 to 6571 in the trailing margin after uh, financial year 2020 you can also see how the profits also going up it was only 417 in uh, 2009 right now it actually quadrupled 2870 uh, in the compounded excuse me if you see the CAGR growth uh, they had a, uh, for the 10 years they have a CAGR growth of 19% which is wonderful 5 years 12% and 3 years 10% uh, uh, they have a TTM margin of uh, 25 uh, uh, in the TTM uh, but if you see TTM they have uh, uh, they have only 25% sales growth uh if you if you see all the all the figures actually uh, um, very good 
but in if you see for, for the five years and three years uh, it had only a little bit of uh, problems but right now the business is uh, booming and uh, you also see the com uh, compounded profit growth in the trailing 12 month uh, 12 month period it's 46 percentage increase in the profits so uh, it is because the pricing uh, linked incentives given for the um, the api manufacturers might have been the main reasons uh, that the the profitability has actually jumped see the ebitda margins in 2010 it was having a ebitda margins of 40 percentage it is only 33 percentage right now but still uh, if you see the industry the bit margin ebitda margin is uh, very high and uh, you can see the uh, profit and uh, pro profit and loss statement uh, the sales as uh, I have previously uh, explained itself the operating margin actually decreased uh, from uh, 2009 to 2000 uh, uh, the the trailing margin uh, trailing 12 months but uh, but but still uh, if you see uh, the operating margin is uh, uh, come uh, at a good percentage of 39 uh, percentage and uh, and operating profits uh, has actually uh, jumped five times from 481 to uh, 2577 close which is which is commendable and uh, other income also going up uh, might be they have a lot of cash pile with them so the other income also uh, going up so everything is positive for them so there is nothing uh, that i i have to mention in this uh, profit and loss account that is uh, very key or uh, the company is doing very well even in the last uh, previous quarters also see how the operating profits have been going up from 319 it's jumped twice i mean uh, it is twice it gone twice uh, from it, the operating profits in march 2015 okay Oh, it's also a profit and loss account only. Sorry. Uh, right now, we are uh, going on to ROA, ROE, and ROC figures. So, uh, look at the ROC. Uh, one, of the, one of the key ratio is ROC. Uh, the better uh, better it is a better uh, financial ratio than uh, ROA and ROE uh, for the companies which are debt free ROCE and ROE are nearly similar but if you if you look at the ROS, ROC itself it, it has a, a high ROC uh, which is at 24.16 percentage it went as high as 32.22 in financial year 14. Right now, ROCES uh, came down, but uh, yeah, this this figure is also high. Uh, is also very good. You can say it's uh, it's very low. Very good numbers. So regarding ROE also, it's also having the same trend. Uh, it's very good from 22.42 uh, uh, percentage in uh, financial year uh, uh, 2010 but still it is also in decent uh, percentage uh, recently also 18.83 percentage it has come down but still uh, a good ratio ROA is 
you can't say aroe is also low they had around even in uh, they had a steady aroe it's around uh, 18.23 percentage in financial year uh, 2010 but they have slightly decreased in uh, 2018 and uh, towards 2020 but still it's a good ratio now we are going on to the risk part of uh, divis laboratories uh they have zero debt and uh, uh with that i can say is that uh, they don't have debt to equity ratio and uh, interest coverage ratios we don't have to discuss anything about it and look at the surplus and reserve figures of uh, divis laboratories around 7256 crores uh, the cash are sitting ideally uh, ideal with them and right now we are going for, for the uh, valuation uh, we would be looking price to uh, book value per share uh, in 2000 uh, financial year 2011 it was having only to, uh, 135 rupees right now uh, in on the trailing margin it has a book value of 314 rupees uh, it's a, it's a book value is the highest right now Uh, and uh, but if you see the price to book value it was only five five times in 2011 right now it is 11 uh, 11 times so price uh, based upon price to book value the uh, the share is overvalued but still given the government uh, policies towards uh, api manufacturing and uh, given the the contribution of uh, i mean the Uh, how st- how strong divis laboratories in the industry itself it still i i still believe it is uh, justifiable and uh, price to earnings and price to book value 49.2 and uh, 11 both are high and right now i am going to discuss sort analysis peer analysis and uh, price patterns my insights so what are what are the strengths as the company they have a high ttm eps person uh, percentage growth in you know, the whole industry itself because they are the one of the largest uh, api manufacturers good growth in recent years good quarterly uh, profit margin low debt uh, strong cash generating ability and annual profits improving last two years book value improving zero promoted pledge fia is increasing share holding a lot of good things happening in divis laboratories uh look at the uh, weakness so mutual funds have decreased share holding uh, because they found it uh, the stock might be overpriced but still uh, i don't think it is not in a uh, overpriced get uh, so uh, they have a decline in net profit uh, falling quarter of quarter the profit um, margin has been decreased and promoter decreasing the share holding i previously also said it is not good and as a threats it has an expensive valuations p value uh, p value is high uh let me discuss with uh, the its peers so uh, mainly i would be uh, discussing with the lupin laboratories so they have similar if you look at the uh, the market capitalization it is the double and uh, if you see the sales quarter uh, lupin has a f- uh, sales quarter of uh, 4117 sales cross sales in uh, last quarter and uh, look at the uh, profit percentage 100 133 percentage i don't know how it's possible but uh, based upon this one uh, they uh, right now there are other uh, the other peers also good so make your own decisions 
one thing about uh, uh, divs laboratories see uh, when it is listed on the stock market it was having only 18 rupees at uh, 2003 right now uh, it has uh, went as high as 4000 rupees itself so see the growth happening and uh, the growth of share uh, price was steady it was uh, not like it has grown uh, grown came down and uh, uh, gone as a wave no it went steady as like this and uh, there was a minor dip in 2017 as i said that was, that was a time when it has an fda negative report and they actually solved the uh, issue and uh, see that in, from 2018 itself it was going up so from my insights uh, the current market price at uh, 3461 it is an it is an overvalued stock uh, but uh, still i think that uh, uh, the share is ideally priced uh, because it is a, a it is a good company good management unique mode high beta margins and uh, a unique product that offers uh, high growth in future to come so uh, my opinion is that uh, investors can wait for market correction but i don't think uh, there won't be huge correction in the near future because the company is highly profitable and uh, given all the circumstances company uh, would do in the quarters to come so still they can choose to buy but it's all about uh, them to have a decision uh, the only risk i'm seeing is the regulatory hurdles in the future related to usfd and other regulatory bodies and uh, disclaimers uh, a casual disclaimer don't make uh, my videos a decision in order to um, uh, purchase or sell uh, this talk so make your own decision guys uh have a nice day uh last feedback give me any feedback uh, that you find uh, positively and negatively i i actually uh, takes both of them as in, uh, in the same spirit